Hey, I want you to turn to two places in the Bible with me. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. Once you get to Matthew chapter 9, I want you to put either your bookmark there, you can leave your finger right there, whatever it is, put your neighbor's hand right there if that helps. And then I want you to turn over to John chapter 4. Only do that if you know your neighbor. It's really weird if you try it and you don't know him. We're going to start in Matthew, or excuse me, we're going to start in John chapter 4. That's where I'm going to start today. And, and, and some of what we're going to see in John chapter 4, you're just going to hear me kind of tell you part of this story. In John chapter 4, we have this story. It's a very popular story of what Jesus meets with the Samaritan woman. You may know this story titled a different way, or The Woman at the Well. How many of you know The Woman at the Well? The story of The Woman at the Well. Well, here's the good news. It's a great story, but I'm not going to preach that today. I'm going to go through that pretty quickly this morning to get someplace, but I don't want you to miss the context of it. And so here's Jesus, and his disciples are in Samaria, which Samaria is a place where Jews didn't really hang out. There was kind of a, there was a little tension between them, cultural tension. There was even some racial tension, you would consider it that, because the Jews looked down upon the Samaritans. They were, they were less than. They were, they were viewed as a people that weren't worth much. And yet Jesus is here with his followers at this time. And as, as Jesus and the followers are there and they're coming through Samaria, Jesus sees a well. It's Jacob's well. And he stops at Jacob's well. And Jesus takes a seat by Jacob's well and tells the disciples, he says, you guys, go ahead. Go on into town. Grab some food. I'll be right here. I'm just going to chill for a little bit. Jesus did that often. He, he separated from the disciples, from the followers, just kind of prayed, took some time, but he had another thing going right here when he separated. It wasn't long after the disciples left that a woman came to the well. And this woman comes to the well. Jesus doesn't know the woman. She doesn't know Jesus. And Jesus' opening line is, would you give me a drink of water? Now, culturally, that might not fly today, Right? Because you've been sitting at the well, why didn't you get your own water, right? <laughs> How many of you go, amen, Pastor Vince, that's right, that's right. But culturally, it would have been something that would have been commonplace for Jesus to say this. Hey, could you give me a drink of water? And she walks through, she goes, well, where's your bucket? You don't have anything to get to the bottom of the well. And then Jesus says, you know, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me to give you a drink of living water. And she, I, I can see it, okay? She makes a face. How many of you know the face I'm talking about? Like, you said what? <laughs> Husbands, do you know what face I'm talking about? Okay. You, what? <laughs> who, do you, <laughs> who, do you think you, who do you think you are? Do you think you're greater than Jacob who dug this well for us? Do you think, do you think you're greater than him who's one of the fathers of the Jewish people? Do you, do you think that's who you are? And Jesus says, you know what, actually, here's the thing. You come to this well and you get this drink of water, but the water that I could offer you, you will never thirst again. Amen. And she says, tell me, about, tell me about this water. I need this water. If you got water where I'm never going to thirst again, I don't have to walk up this stinking hill to get, you tell me about it. And Jesus steps right into her story and goes, <clears throat> hey, can you go get your husband? <laughs> No. No, I don't have a husband. That's her line. And Jesus, I don't know. I wish I could have seen this moment because I don't know if he's like playing it cool. And he's like, I know. Actually, you don't have a husband. You had five husbands. And the one you're with now Ain't even your husband. And then it gets real, real quick. How many of you know when we're confronted stu with stuff, it gets real, real quick? Y'all been there in a Sunday service, I don't know whether it's me or another preacher, all of a sudden you're like listening along and it's flowing along and all of a sudden the pastor says something and you're like, oh! And you're like looking at your spouse going, how do you know? Did you call him? Did you tell him? Why'd you tell him? She's like, I didn't tell him. He just talked to me 10 minutes ago. Where you been? And so we have this, and this is what happens. Jesus, I'm going to tell you, so I'm going to give you this real quick out of this story before we get to actually what I want to preach to you today. 
But Jesus in regards to evangelism. Regards to evangelism. You want to share Jesus with people. You want to share the gospel with people. There's a way to do it. First of all, be interesting. Don't be boring. Don't be hateful. Don't be judgmental. Don't be smarter than everybody else. Be interesting. Jesus' opening line was, give me some water. Or could you give me some water? And she's like, where's your bucket? He said, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd know that I could give you living water. Ears perked up. The what? He was interesting. It wasn't boring. The Bible is not boring. Jesus Christ is not boring. Come on, somebody. He is not boring. And so I believe Christians should be the least boring people in the world because we have a Savior who died and then got up. Okay? So like that, that in itself is not boring. But Jesus starts with that. He's interesting. He engages with her. He starts this conversation. And they didn't know each Well, he's Jesus, Pastor Vince. He knew everybody. She didn't know him. And he engaged with her in this conversation. And then when it got to the point where he realized he had a, an ability to share something valuable with her, he confronted her. But he didn't confront her with judgment. He didn't throw her under the bus. A lot of times we read that passage and we think Jesus might have been being snarky and he was not. It wasn't, oh, you have five husbands. Everybody knows who you are. That's not what he did. He just told her the truth. He's like, actually, you don't have a husband, do you? The guy you're with now, is, he's, not, he's not the one. And you've, you've ran into this a couple times, Right? And he wasn't mean, he wasn't bitter, he just, he engaged, and then he was truth and love. Just shared her story. And as they walk through that story together, she finally gets to the place and she says, you know, I've heard these Jews, I've heard these Jews have prayed about a Messiah that's coming, the one who will be called the Christ. And Jesus said, the one whom you're speaking with, I am He. She says, please give me this living water. And he shares with her him and the gospel. And she takes off. She takes off, man. She runs back to town. This man that I've seen, he told me everything about me. And he didn't even know me. People there, here comes the crazy lady running down from the well. Because she is outside of herself right now trying to tell this story. He didn't, he didn't even, I don't know him. And he don't know me. And he told me. What did he tell you about? He told me about you and you and you and you. And I, I, don't, know, I don't know what to, I don't know. I just got to tell you. And he told me there was living water and I would never thirst again. I would never be the same again. And that's what he told me. And so that's what happens. And then we get into the next part where the disciples show up. I love the disciples, okay? I love the disciples. They're followers. At this point, they're not necessarily disciples. We don't have official names for them. They're just, they're followers of Jesus Christ. And the followers are there with Jesus Christ in John chapter 4. And this is what happens. It says that meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, you need to eat. Remember, they went to go get food. And Jesus starts preaching to him. He says, I have food to eat that you don't know about. He's, uh, he's pumped. He just had a moment with somebody. And he's like, I don't need no food right now. I'm good. And the disciples, like you and I, are clueless. Clueless. Here's one of them. He says, um, so the disciples said to one another, did you, did, you, did you bring him something to eat? Who brought him something to eat? And then they start discussing amongst themselves. I'm sure they're like, Peter was talking too much. He wouldn't have brought him something to eat. <laughs> Thomas, he doubted he was even hungry. So, like, I don't know where it came from, but they're, they're, they're missing it. And finally, Jesus says to him, he says, look, 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 look. My food is to do, to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. Do not say there are yet four months. Then comes the harvest. What's happening here is Jesus is setting them up. Because remember the lady had ran back to the town. And she had told all the people about all that Jesus had done to her. All that Jesus had told her. All that Jesus had shared with her. And she went back and told them. And she's like, you've got to come see him. He's probably still at the well. And so Jesus is having this conversation with the disciples. And it's up close and it's personal. He's like, hey. He's like, I don't need food. What I, what me doing the will of my father is my food. He said, in fact. And he's setting them up. And he's so good at this. He says, you know how you say 
in four months will be the harvest? You know, you know, I mean, we live in an agricultural community here. Peter, James, John, I know you guys are fishermen, but you get it, right? In four months, when the season turns, it'll be the harvest. They're like, yeah. In verse 36, or verse 35, he says, look. Look. And the crowd from Samaria is coming up over the hill where the woman had went and told him. And he said, look, I'm telling you now, the harvest is white. The fields are white for harvest. If you'll open your eyes, you'll see there's greater work to be done than what sandwich you're going to eat for lunch. Look, the fields are white with harvest. And he goes on. And he goes, already the one who reaps is rejoicing and sees that the fields are white. Already, excuse me, already, verse 36. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. Verse 38, I want you to catch this. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. That word sent is ekbalo. Everybody say ekbalo. Okay, I just, you just learned Greek today at church. Ekbalo. Now I'm going to get into what that means here in a second because I want to go to another place in Scripture. Now if you have your Bible, we're going to read about the same story in a different place in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, we see Matthew write about it, but he doesn't go into the detail of the Samaritan woman at the well, but he kinda, we kind of come back into this conclusion that Jesus makes with the disciples. The same idea about harvest and how the fields are white. But there's an issue. And so we see Jesus pick it up in verse 35 of chapter 9. And it said, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, and here's where it starts to get familiar, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, they're few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to ekbalo out laborers into his harvest. Ekbalo. I love this word. I'm loving this word more the more I study it. The word ekbalo means to be pushed out. (laughs) That's what it means. Ekbalo. To be pushed with force out. To be moved from one place intentionally to another. How many parents have ekbaloed your kid from time to time? How many of you like to ekbalo them more? Yeah. You have been sent. You have been ekbaloed. You've been pushed out of what's normal into something that's uncomfortable. Everybody knows that's an interesting thing. Hey, everybody look at your neighbor and introduce yourself to your neighbor right now. Just say hello. Now, here's what I want you to do. Now that you know your neighbor, this isn't going to be weird, okay? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to put one hand. One of you put one hand up like that, and the other one put their hand on it. So you and your neighbor should be touching hands just like this. Now, how many of you feel tension from the other one pushing just a little bit? You can stop. I don't want to fight. (laughs) We as humans, we don't like to be pushed. In fact, when we feel something pushing against us, how many of you felt the natural reaction to push back? And you don't even know the person. We don't even know him, and we're like, don't you push me. I'll push you back. (laughs) And sadly, we miss this reality that we do the same thing. And this is why God has to ekbalo 
us. Big days. We've been talking about big days. There's a lot, I mean, springtime, lots of big days. Friday night, graduation in Mountain Home, Arkansas. It was a big day for some people. So proud of you guys. All of you that have graduated all over our area and our region. If you graduated, good on you. But I'm also going to tell you, the day after graduation is kind of a day where it's like, woo! I don't know what to do with my hands now because I don't know what I'm doing. You see kids come out of school and they're like, I'm going to college, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And all of a sudden life goes, and none of their plan worked. Anybody been there? I'm going to get out, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to make a million dollars in my first five years, I'm going to retire on the lake. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Big days are great. I remember in my life that I've had several big days. October 18th, 1997, I turned and looked out those double doors of that church and in walked my wife. And I, I, I tried to sing to her on our wedding day. <laughs> this is some Stephen Curtis Chapman song. It's a beautiful song, but I butchered it. Because as soon as I seen her, I was a mess. I was like, <laughs> it was like snot. And they're like, you may kiss the bride. She's like, <laughs> no, nah, she didn't. She didn't. She kissed me. Then after that, February 15th, 1999, God blessed us with a little curly-headed girl named Vanessa. February 21st, 2001, blessed us with a curly-headed girl. Well, she didn't have any hair until she was like three. (laughs) Kaylee. March 21st of 2003, blessed us with Brayden. January 3rd, 2007, he blessed us with Parker. May 29th, 2008, our surprise, Caleb. We didn't anticipate having two 16 months apart. Caleb come along and he's awesome. And December 16th, 2016, that's not when we got her. We got her in January. And then she became ours 18 months later and gave us Bryn. And all of those were big days where my life changed. Just after Vanessa was born, Actually, just after Kaylee was born, I was in a revival service on a Tuesday night. Oh, it's good. Man, this guy was throwing down. He pastors a little church down in Morningstar, which is down 14 south between, between nothing and Marshall. Okay? Uh, if you think I'm kidding, <laughs> you go try to find it. All right? He pastors a little church called Loafer's Glory. And I'm like, if there was not a church made for me, that's it. Loafer's Glory. But Brother Setterfield came that Tuesday night and was preaching the hide off his Bible, man, laying it down. And he stopped at my pew and he said, son, didn't know my name. Why aren't you preaching? See, because God had already mentioned, he'd whispered to me. But I didn't listen. And God knew that I needed a little ekbalo. I needed a push. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He pushed me that night when that preacher put his arm on my shoulder and I fell down in the floor. I didn't, wasn't slain in the spirit. I was just a wreck, man. I just wept in the seat there. And six weeks later, I was a full-time pastor. They had no idea what hit him. <laughs> Neither did I. But it was a big day for me. And sometimes what I see is here in the scripture, these disciples, they're sitting here watching the Samaritans walk over the hill. And Jesus said, there's the harvest. And the Jews went. (laughs) No. No, we're not. Those are Samaritans. We, we 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 don't jive with them, Jesus. You know this. You're a Jew. You know. See, the disciples weren't there for the conversation with the woman at the well. They didn't hear what Jesus said, that there's coming a day when you will worship and you will worship in spirit and in truth. That's all in that story with the woman at the well where Jesus is saying, this isn't a Jew thing. This isn't a Gentile thing. It's not a Samaritan thing. It's a Jesus thing. And when people get it, it changes everything. And so he's pushing the disciples out. He's going, I need to ekbalo you. I need to push you out a little bit. Some of you right now, you've been in church for a long time and you've never moved beyond God having to push you out into something. It's what you just keep repeating. You wait and you wait. God, I'm not sure. God, I'm not sure. God, I'm not sure. And he has, to, he has to push you and go, come on. There's something great on the other side of this. Well, Lord, I'm going to have to change some stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to change some stuff. But 
listen, I'm telling you as a pastor in a world where pastors are falling away and churches are closing at a rate, I hope this doesn't surprise you. We cannot keep up with. We can't plant enough churches to keep up with what's closing. 1,500 a month. The organization that I partner with, some of my friends, my pastor friends, 20%, one in five churches do not have a pastor. And they're not coming back. Why? Because we need God to push us. Some of you are called. Some of you, God has spoke to you and he has said, it's you, it's you. It's you. Still small voice. He's whispered it. He's told you. He did to me for a year. Hey, Vince, this is what I want you to do. I'm like, cool story, God. Not me. <laughs> I'm not your guy. I'm not your guy. I'm not your guy. And finally that night in that revival service, Ekbalo, he pushed Vince. I've got to send you out. You don't know yet. You're not ready yet. But I have got to send you out. Why? Because down the road, there's going to be a church in Mountain Home that you don't see coming yet. But there's going to be life change that happens there. There's going to be families restored there. There's going to be people come to Jesus. And, and why? If I don't push you out, we miss. And so I got to push you out a little bit. God, I don't want to be pushed out. I'm terrified. I don't want to do this. God, I'll do anything. There are Christian cars I could sell because I'll do that, God. <laughs> he said, nope. <laughs> Kick me right out. Kick me right out. Check this out, though. In Matthew chapter 9, you see something pretty amazing that happens. Jesus has this conversation with the disciples and it's a good one. Man, I got to hurry. It's a good conversation. But he has this conversation with the disciples and he says, wait, 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 wait. Now that you know, I've got to push you out and you're going to have, to, and the Bible tells us in the story, go back to John and read it, that when they stayed, they stayed two extra days in Samaria and many people came to know Jesus and they came to know Jesus, not because the, the, the woman at the well went back to the city. It was because of the stories of everybody receiving life change from Jesus Christ, the disciples going and witnessing what they, they had been ekbalowed out, but they had went to work and it changed. John or Matthew chapter 10 we see Jesus pick up and the story goes like this in John chapter, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 10. And he called to him his 12 disciples. Now he's, now he's going to make it individual. These 12 disciples and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. It's important that you realize that's where they're first called apostles. Simon, who is called Peter. Andrew, Simon's brother. James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus. And Thaddeus. Some of you are like, there was a Thaddeus? Yeah, we don't hear much about Thaddeus. I'm sure, he was the introvert of the group. Simon the Zealot, which that's a great study if you get a chance. Go dig in on the Zealots and see where Simon came from. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Verse 5, here's what I want you to catch. These 12, Jesus, what's it say? Ekbalo. Nope. It's not the word there. It's not the word anymore. Still says sent out, just like it said in chapter 9. Just like it said over in the book of John. Still says sent out or send out. Ekbalo, it's got to be ekbalo, right? No, not in, the Jew, not in the Greek words. He says, this is a different word. What's the word? Why is it different? He said, because once you do get beyond being ekbaloed out, then I can apostello. Apostello means to be sent with a purpose and direction. You see, so what happens is, Joe, come here. Stand right here in front of me. What happens is, we all have this season where God has to push us out. 
right? Can we get us just can we all agree that that happened? Whether you're sitting in a service and you didn't see it coming and the conviction of God sets on your heart and you're like, why is he talking to me? And he's going, I'm trying to push you out into something. But then once you've been pushed out, Jesus in his grace, and he goes, hey, I know that was uncomfortable. But if you'll look right over there, that's where I'm sending you. That's the purpose for your life. That's the direction for your life. And I'm going to prepare you. Notice what it said Jesus did. He gave them authority to cast out. He gave them authority to heal. He gave them authority to teach. He gave them everything that they needed once they had been pushed out. And once they had been pushed out, then Jesus gave them what they needed. He said, there. There, go live in your purpose. Go live in your call. Go live in, go live in what I'm asking you to do. And here's the problem, church, is that I believe in the American church, we've all got super comfortable being ekbalod, even though we desire the purpose. God, show me your purpose. He's like, I can't force you off your couch. I can't get you out of a pew and you want me to give you purpose? I'm having to ekbalo you every weekend. I don't know if I can push anymore. Yeah, but God, if you'll just give me your purpose and direction in life. He's like, I need you to stand up first. I need you to buy into the reality that I'm calling you. That everything in your life matters. But only if everything in your life is based in me. Ekbalo, I'll push you out. But if you'll go, if you'll, ta- if you'll take the step, if you'll step out, then I'll make you an apostle. Then I'll give you a purpose. Then I'll give you a direction. Then I'll give you the equipment you need to fulfill that direction. I can remember the first time I sang in church. I was about five years old. And my dad, he said, come on, but we're going to sing. It's like, I don't want to sing. And my father did not apostello me. He did not say, hey, here's why we're going to sing. No, he ekbaloed me. He's like, you get out there and you sing this song to Jesus. Yes, sir. <laughs> this is what was happening to my microphone right here. I was terrified. I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know what God was doing at the moment. But even at that age, I needed to be ekbal. I needed to be pushed out a little bit. Some of you right now in your life, you've been in church for a long time and you have lived in being pushed out of situations in your life and you're missing the beauty You're missing the beauty of knowing God's purpose for your life. You're living by conviction only, not direction. You live in Sunday to Sunday, hoping the pastor says something that shakes you a little bit, gets you reading. No, no, listen. You know, I live my life and I, I, I don't ask God for direction anymore. What? No, no, listen, hear me out. I'm following him now, knowing that he guides my steps already. That, I, that if he don't want me walking through this door, guess what he's going to do? <laughs> Shut the door. I don't got to go that way. I don't have to quit walking. I'm not coming to a crossroads, not with God. He shuts the door and I turn left. I keep walking. He shuts the door. I turn right. I get to this place. God, hey, I'm just following you. Why? Because I've already been pushed out, but now I'm living called out. And some of you in your life, if you would just step beyond God pushing you. Listen, I believe God's calling pastors and missionaries and teachers and leaders and all of those things out of this house. Out of this house. But I don't get to drag you to it. I don't get to drag you to it. Some of you today, God's pushing. I want you to bow with me. I don't know who you are, but there's a reason I'm stopping right now, and you're it. I don't know who you are, but God has been rattling your cage with this. He has been wrecking you with this. He's been pushing you. You've been saying, hey, There's more. There's more. I know you're scared. I know you don't know what's on the other side of it. I'll tell you what's on the other side of it. Jesus is on the other side of it. Chapter 9, it's Ekbalo. Chapter 10, it's Apostello. Jesus is in both situations. He's there for both of them. 
What are you waiting on? Pastor Vince, I got some stuff. Peter had some stuff. It says when he listed Judas, the one who betrayed him. You think that was a shock? No, he was still called. You may have some stuff. But don't put God in a position to keep pushing you out when you could be living on purpose. So come on. If you're here and you know God's had to push you for a long time. He keeps having to push you. He keeps having to remind you. He keeps having to tell you, hey, don't forget the cross. Don't forget what I did. Can I get some help? Can I, can I get your involvement? Can I get your service? Can I get you to, to follow me? You can't be living there, Christians. That's not where we live. That's where we start. Is God calling you out? If so, come answer. Come kneel at an altar and answer and say, God, I'm tired of you having to push me. What's the purpose for my life? God, I'm tired of you having to nudge me. What's the calling for my life? God, I'm tired of having to figure this. What what do you want me to do, God? I'm right here, and I I want to follow you, and I want to serve you, and I want want to be yours, God, but, but I'm so, I keep fighting it. I keep pushing against it. Come on. Come on, you're not going to be by yourself. There's people down here praying, and you know if it's you. You know right now if it's you that God is going, I got something great for you, but I keep having I keep having to push you out to go get it. There ought to be something in your life that just wants to go get it because it's it's mine and it's for you. It's mine and it's for you. Come on. Christians. You've been Christian for a long time. You still having to be pushed out. God's still having to ek follow you or are you are you following? Are you tracking? Are you listening? Do you hear him clearly? Do you understand that you walk in a way that God just shuts doors? He don't have to, he don't have to grab your hand. He doesn't have he just shuts them and opens them and you know where to walk because you've been following that long. Christians, if that's not you, that's where we ought to be. That's who we ought to be as his people. You need to get it right with God. You need to set it straight with God. You can do that in your seat. You can do that in, up here in the altar. Right now, I'm just going to ask you, if you're here and you're sitting in the seats, no one looking around, would you say, Pastor Vince, this is me. God's had to push me. He's had to push me. He's had to push me because I keep fighting it. I keep stepping back into my old ways. I keep doing the things I used to do. And I keep falling back into that. But God keeps calling me. He keeps knocking at my door. He keeps coming after me to get me. And I just want to follow him. I want to follow him, Pastor Vince. If that's you this morning, you're sitting in the seats. Would you just lift your hand and put it right back down? I want to pray for you. Come on. Come on. Yeah, hands everywhere. This isn't new. This isn't odd. This is us. This is who we are as believers. We, we trip and fall. We stumble. We get back up. We trip and fall. We stumble. We get back up. I just want you to trust that God today has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. If you'll submit to walking in it. If you'll submit to walking in it. Father in heaven, I love you. Jesus, I pray for these that have come down. God, I pray. I pray for the pastor, for the preacher, for the missionary, for the children's teacher, for the worship leader. God, I pray for the people who are stepping into a call this morning, who have said, Jesus, here I am. Send me. Whatever it is you got for me, God, I'm here for it. I trust you. I believe you. You've never let me down, and I'm going to walk in that, God. So I pray for them this morning. I pray for those that right now, God, are maybe taking the first step. And today, today was that Ekbalo step. It was the first time they felt pushed that there could be something greater in their life. God, I pray they'd answer. I pray they'd answer. And Father, we ask all this, all of this in the holy, holy name of Jesus. God, make us your apostles. God, make us those you send out on purpose. Let it be that big day. Let it be that big day. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand this morning. Come on.